We talked about the kernel trick, which allows us to implicitly work with infinite dimensional feature vectors and in which the obtained models base their predictions on a linear combinations of the training data using the kernel. Now we will introduce a particularly powerful machine learning method based on this kernel viewpoint. In this video, uh, we define support vector machines, which eventually will turn out to be models that, that base their predictions on only a few of the original data points, and they are therefore fast to compute. Now in this video, we first start with a geometric motivation or let's say derivation of support vector machines. And then in the remaining videos, we will explain support vector machines in the context of kernel methods. So before we explain that kernel methods, uh, they can be very powerful because they can implicitly work with feature representations that can be infinite dimensional. But these kernel methods can be also somewhat slow because they uh, base their predictions uh, on an evaluation of the kernel function for all possible uh, training points. Now, support vector machines base their predictions on only a subset of the training points. So if I relate this to my original models, we have this, uh, let's call it the primal viewpoint, in which I have models, predictive models, could be classification or regression that are parameters by a, parameterized by a set of weights W. So they are of the following form. Maybe in the classification setting, uh, we have some generalized model, but let, let's consider regression in this case. And then we talked about what we call a dual viewpoint in which my uh, model is parameterized by these dual parameters, which essentially define how to base my prediction uh, on a linear combination of my kernel evaluated uh, relative to um, all my uh, existing data points in, in a training set. Now, in general, these uh, kernel methods are slower than my uh, regular linear models, right? Because they have to evaluate this kernel uh, for, for all of the data points. But now with support vector machines, we're going to develop such kernel methods, so such kernel machines that work with uh, these, these dual components, which are sparse, meaning that there are only a few non-zero ANs. So we, can, we only have to evaluate this kernel for only my support vectors, uh, essentially. Okay, so that's what we're going to do in the remaining videos. We're going to derive support vector machines, which are these, which is a kernel method in which the predictions are based on only a, a subset of my uh, uh, original training set. And these methods can then be applied for a classification, for regression. But it turns out that you can also apply uh, such kernel methods, such support vector machine methods, actually, for a novelty detection or anomaly detection. Now, I'm not going to cover this in the videos. Uh, but it's good to know that, that you can do such thing as anomaly detection. And the main idea is that I can train my kernel method uh, with my training set, of which I assume that there are no outliers or it's like a normal, uh, proper data set. Um, but then if a new test point comes in, then I have a way of determining how unusual this particular data point is. Okay, but the main point is with support vector machines, we can cover uh, the applications that we're used to and a little bit more. And then another important property is that these support vector machines are obtained via a convex optimization framework, which means that there is only one solution that is optimal. And we are able to derive this particular solution. And this is nice, right? And you don't have this, for example, with neural networks, where you have to rely on a lot of local optima, and maybe one solution is better than the others. With support vector machines, we deal with a convex optimization problem, so we only need to derive one particular solution. Now, a possible disadvantage of support vector machines is that we do not have a good probabilistic interpretation of these models. Um, but as, so we will cover this in the next lecture, actually in the next lecture, we're going to cover probabilistic kernel methods. So uh, we do have probabilistic alternatives to support vector machines, but those are not necessarily uh, sparse anymore. So uh, that's a nice property of support vector machines that they work with uh, sparse uh, support vectors. Okay, so today we're going to talk about support vector machines for binary classifications, and we're going to derive these support vector machines from a principle of maximizing uh, the margin in my classifier. And with that, I mean the following. First of all, we are going to consider a linear classifier, right? So this particular model, so uh, this defines a particular decision boundary. And we're going to say that points 
uh, that are mapped to the positive side of this decision boundary. So for which y evaluates to some positive number that is assigned to class one. And if the model evaluates to a negative value, then this uh, point gets uh, assigned to the negative class. So there's a typo here. This should be a smaller than. Okay, so that's just a linear uh, classification. And then for now, we're going to assume that my data set is linearly separable, meaning that it is possible to define a decision boundary for which my data sets are perfectly separable. So this is actually an invalid decision boundary because it doesn't nicely separate the classes. Uh, but this is a valid decision boundary, so it classifies all points correctly. Uh, this one is also a valid one. And this one is also a classifier that does a perfect job that perfectly separates uh, the two classes. So this one doesn't separate the classes, uh, but all the other three, those are actually uh, perfectly performing classifiers. Though one out of these uh, three options is better than the others, right? And it is this one. And why is this the case? So it is the case because it has the largest margin from the decision boundary to all other points. Um, considering the following, suppose one of my data points just lies out of uh, this distribution, then now it's incorrectly classified. The same for this case, uh, but it isn't the case in, in this particular figure. And this is the case because my decision boundary is so close to my original data points. So it's very sensitive to these uh, kind of situations. And the same if I have a data point just out of the red distribution, it's still close by. Well, in this case, it, it gets uh, misclassified, uh, but in this case, it won't be. So this tells us that we're looking for a decision boundary, which is far away from all the points, basically. So we want to maximize the margin between my decision boundary and really the closest point in my data set to this decision boundary. Now let's see if we can uh, characterize or capture this notion of a decision boundary of this margin in, in formulas. Now, first of all, recall that my decision boundary is given by the following equation, right? It's all the points for which uh, y of x evaluate to zero. So that, that's this decision boundary on the right uh, in the red uh, color and points on this side will be assigned a positive class and when y evaluates to, to, to a negative number it gets assigned to the negative class. So that's indicated over here. Now also recall from uh, the video on uh, discriminant functions that we can capture the distance or so the distance from a point x to the decision boundary Let's see, note it with the R, it's indicated with the following formula. So really the absolute value of Y uh, divided by the norm of W. So the distance to the decision boundary scales with my value Y. And in the figure, it's indicated with this distance, uh, right? Okay, so now if you want to maximize the distance from all points to my uh, decision boundary, uh, I have to maximize this particular thing over here. And so I have to compute the absolute value of my prediction. Uh, but now also recall that uh, my data set was perfectly, it's linearly separable. So that means I can find a model that correctly assigns a positive value for each data point if it indeed belongs to the positive class and a negative value if it belongs to the negative class. So that really means that uh, my model is able uh, to satisfy this constraint that for each target, I give the corresponding signed uh, output. So if my target is positive, plus one, I need to return a positive value. So it returns this product is positive. And if my target is negative, I need to return a negative value. So this product is also positive. So that means in this linearly separable case, I do not have to write this absolute value, this modulus uh, sign over here, but I can just take the product TN, YN over here. So this really defines uh, the same thing. Okay, so we have a way of quantifying the distance of a particular uh, predicted point to the decision boundary. So let's, now let's give a definition of the margin. So we're going to uh, define the margin as the per perpendicular distance from the decision boundary to the closest point xn. Meaning that if this is my decision boundary, then this is the closest point over here. So this is the closest point. And my, and the distance that it has to my decision boundary will be called the margin. Okay, so for each data point, I can determine the distance to the decision boundary that's given by this uh, formula over here. And now I want to select uh, the point which minimizes this distance, right? So the closest point to my decision boundary. So my margin is defined as follows. So it's really defined by the index n 
that minimizes this quantity, which represents the distance to the uh, decision boundary. So this is the margin and we want to maximize this uh, with respect to my model parameters w and b. Uh, but now there's some ambiguity uh, going on. There's several choices for w and b that satisfy the same margin or that lead to the same margin actually. And you can see that as, as follows. So I can multiply my w with some value kappa. So kappa times w times b and times w. And this evaluates to the exact same value as you see on the left hand side. So I can choose multiple values for w of b that all result in the same margin. So there's some ambiguity in my optimization framework. So I'm going to constrain it. I'm going to say, uh, I mean, I can choose my w um, in several ways, but now I'm going to say I have to choose my w in such a way that for the point closest to the decision boundary, the numerator, so this term, evaluates to one. And I can do this, right? Because um, I'm minimizing this particular thing. I can choose several values for kappa that result in the same margin. So let's just make it simple for ourselves. Let's choose kappa in such a way that this numerator evaluates to one. Okay, so that's, uh, that's set over here. And once I've done that, then this also implies that for all the other data points, uh, this numerator will be larger uh, or equal to one. Okay, so that then defines my margin. And then my objective is to maximize so I'm going to choose the model parameters that maximize the margin. And this margin is a function of W and B. So for a particular set of W and B, this will be my decision boundary and then this will be the margin. You see, I can still widen this uh, interval uh, to really fill this gap. And this could be, for example, my optimal uh, decision boundary because it really maximizes uh, the margin. And now in this case, so we have actually two types of data points, points that are lie exactly on the decision boundary. So those are the points for which uh, this expression evaluates to one. And for all, all other points, uh, the numerator has some value bigger than one. Okay, with this in place, we know that the distance to the decision boundary is given by uh, this expression. And we also said that the numerator in this term is going to be equal to one where this thing is equal to one for the point closest to the decision boundary. So the point closest to the decision boundary uh, for those terms, this numerator equals uh, one. So that really implies that the distance, so the margin size uh, for these points is simply given by one over W because for the points closest to the decision boundary, this term evaluates to one and thus the margin size is given by one over uh, the norm of W. Okay, that's nice. So that tells us really that uh, this is the problem that we're solving. We want to maximize this quantity, but still under the constraint that for my closest point, a denominator evaluates to this thing. So this uh, property needs to be satisfied for the closest point. And equivalently, this means that we can actually impose the following constraint to my maximization problem. Right, because maximizing this particular thing means minimizing this value for W and that also leads to a, a downscaling of this particular term, but we, it cannot be smaller than one. And this constraint will then make sure that the points closest to the decision boundary will have uh, that this expression evaluates to one and all other points so further away from this decision boundary or further away from the margin will have a uh, positive uh, value for this uh, particular term. Okay, so that then really defines the problem that we're trying to solve. We want to maximize the margin under the constraint that uh, this particular term has to be bigger or equal to one for all data points n. And instead of maximizing this particular thing, we're going to minimize the norm of w, right? That, that, for, that forms a, an equivalent optimization problem because the optimizer of this minimization problem of uh, w squared is going to be equal to the maximizer of this thing. And we prefer this form actually. So uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to maximize the margin by minimizing the squared norm of w under the constraint that for each of my n data points, uh, that each for, for each data point, this particular term evaluates to um, bigger or equal than one. This then defines a constraint optimization problem where we have a quadratic uh, objective that we want to minimize under linear constraints. So this constitutes a quadratic programming problem. And we, there are plenty of algorithms in place that can readily, readily solve these type of problems. And now what I'm not going to do is, is uh, I'm go not going to explain exactly how to perform this optimization, how to solve this problem numerically, but I do, uh, want to explain the main principles behind constraint optimization. 
because this the main principle behind uh, constraint optimization is derived from the fact that um, equivalent to this primal optimization problem, so this is what we want to solve, we can formulate a corresponding dual optimization problem and uh, via uh, the dual Lagrangian. And if we are able to, to solve this dual optimization problem, then we have also solved our original primal optimization problem. And it turns out that this optimization via this dual objective naturally uh, leads to this dual viewpoint or this kernel viewpoint that we've been uh, talking about before. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to talk about a uh, constraint optimization problem with this perspective of solving a uh, optimizing a particular Lagrangian versus optimizing a dual Lagrangian. And then I'll apply these notions to this, this specific problem of, a, of obtaining a maximum margin classifier and show that we naturally obtain a kernel method for a classification in which the dual vector is sparse meaning that my predictions are based on a sparse subset of my original data points. And as such, we will derive a sparse support vector machines.